So, nap time is over. <laughs> Welcome to our show. We want to demonstrate today what um, I and the CEA, so the, the um, Papyrus project team, and I have developed for a customer of the, C of the CEA. And it's about life cycle management for models. So just to introduce ourselves, I'm Eike Stepper, the lead of the CDO model repository project at Eclipse. And that is Florian Noiry from CEA, um, working in the Papyrus projects and internally for CEA customers, correct? Right. Good, we've prepared the following um, schedule for you. We'll first um, give you a very brief introduction into the core concepts of EMF and CDO. From there, Florian will tell you about the motivation um, for developing something new on top of it. Um, after that, I will, dem I will show you the concepts that we developed on top of CDO to fulfill the new requirements that we've seen before. Then Florian will show you um, a very nice live demo of the uh, customer product that was developed inside CEA. And then we'll hopefully have some time for questions and answers. Okay, let's start with a brief introduction into um, EMF. EMF, the Eclipse Modeling Framework, it's all about models. Models are object graphs, as you can see here. Um, in EMF, the object graphs are always contained in resources and these resources are loaded and managed by resource sets. When the application navigates through this model, it can happen that um, a pointer points outside a resource, so the resource set loads the needed additional resources, so that from an application point of view, these te technical concepts, resource and resource set, are mostly transparent. When you use EMF models with CDO together, then you have a whole bunch of additional functionality. We won't go into the details of all of these things, but um, obviously persistence, transactionality, uh, lazy loading of single objects and many more are very interesting things that CDO adds mostly transparently on top of EMF. So um, the core concepts that CDO uh, provides are a CDO view set, which is an adapter on the resource set of EMF. And this view set manages single CDO views. What is a CDO view? Um, this is a very stripped down version of the interface that you can use. Um, it allows to point into a branch and a time in your model repository. And the view assembles the object graph consistently how in the form it was in that branch at that time. And then you can um, get the resources out of this view. Um, the models, the object graphs that you receive from the view are read only unless you use a subclass, a subinterface of view, that is the CDO transaction. And the object graph here is writable. You can call setters and mutate the lists, call commit on the transaction, or roll it back. So pretty simple concepts. Um, a view itself is not directly connected to the repository. The physical network connection is managed by a CDO session, and that connects to the external CDO repository. So. Just to explain why it's called a CDO view set, um, I mentioned already, it can manage multiple CDO views which come from their own sessions and there's a restriction. This, each of these views must come from a distinct, uh, um, a different repository. So that means you can assemble object graphs across multiple object repositories. So this was the, the core level, the, the API layer of CDO, which you can use in your applications. But we provide also some, let's say, exemplary um, user interface. It's 
become pretty sophisticated over the years. So for example, to manage the connection information, there's um, an Eclipse view, the CTO repositories view, where you can um, configure your connections and it remembers them across Eclipse restarts. And from there, you can check out the object graphs from your repositories. Um, we don't have a separate view for that. We do that through a Project Explorer integration, which displays the, the live objects as if they were in the local workspace, but they are not, of course. So I think now we come to the part where Florian will explain you um, what they wanted to do for their customer and what was missing in CDO for that. So the customer wanted to build a tool which is called AMS. Um, it's a tool that we want to design in the context of, um, as we will see, modeling something called computer-based interlocking systems. So you have kind of a picture on the left. It's basically all the signaling system that you have along the way of railways, uh, lights, switches, and stuff like that. And um, as you can imagine, th those systems are very critical. Uh, and in our context, what it means is that we need to be very picky on uh, making sure that we are working with the right uh, version of artifacts um, and the right uh, models for uh, artifact, I mean. And it's also, uh, as you can also imagine, deeply complex. Uh, there are uh, one, one simple, sort of say, uh, computer-based interlocking system is uh, more than 700 uh, state machines uh, with uh, 245 uh, possible uh, input events and uh, 333 uh, possible output events. And in France, uh, there are thousands of those CBIs uh, in, uh, in the, on the French uh, railway um, uh, system. So uh, based on this, uh, our customer, which is uh, SNCF, the, the national um, uh, railway uh, company, uh, they have all this expertise on uh, designing uh, those systems, on validating them, on proving uh, them, on deploying them. Uh, but uh, so far, it was mostly a, a paper-based work uh, to, to do this uh, design. And they wanted to have a tool called AMS, it's a French name to say Atelier de Métier de Signalisation. Uh, and basically, it's a modeling tool to do formal design and validation of those systems, uh, all based on modeling technologies of uh, Eclipse. So the tool as such looks like something like that. It's integrated on the Eclipse platform. You have uh, pretty much... Uh, you, you have many of the modeling technologies from Eclipse. You have Papyrus uh, on the middle with the state machines. You will have uh, Xtext um, on the left part, which is here used for the testing libraries. You have the track um, things, which is a diagram rendering of the uh, railway uh, tracks and some validations and, and everything. Um, the simulation is running using all those models all together. So at the end, when you do a real modeling for the real cases, you end up with a model on the middle here, which is the CBI, but actually depends on many other modeling artifacts. Uh, as I was mentioning some, there were some proof libraries, testing libraries, signal libraries, and so on. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, it's a very s like super complex system, which will actually rely on many people working on that, many stakeholders with a particular expertise. Uh, so CBI designers, CBI uh, engineers, you have uh, testers, you have uh, proof engineers, and uh, also external companies contributing artifacts that uh, are supposed to refer to each other. And uh, so th the motivation is based on this um, complex modeling uh, thing, how we can um, work together in collaboration. And uh, so the first principle we, we tried to apply was to, to uh, have a divide and conquer strategy and basically split the models into uh, versioned uh, modules. 
try to introduce uh, OSGI, OSGI like uh, manifest uh, basically to be able to uh, define the version of the module and uh, declare the dependencies among those modules together with the branch of um, the version range, which is uh, the version you want to have as dependency, and uh, ultimately re rely on a resolver uh, to be able to assemble all those modules together into the complete system so that it, it makes sense at the end. And the second principle we wanted, to, we applied is evolving isolation because teams are working on each artifact on their own pace. Uh, we need to be able also to handle at the life cycle of those uh, modules in a systematic uh, approach of the delivery of each version. Be able to define your own um, delivery types. So in our case, it was a release, tags, and milestone, but it could be different. And also try to give all the basis to do a review process uh, of the various contributions before releasing. I will end it, uh, give it to Ike to complete. Okay, so the problem is clear now, and um, in the next couple of slides, I will show you what we have developed together on top of CDO, basing on the CDO concepts that I already showed. So it's all about the term of a modular system. So let's start with the first part of it, the module. Um, in this, uh, sorry, in this modular system, we try to look at two different dimensions. A static dimension, which yeah, where you define the statics of the system, the, the modular decomposition of the system. Um, we, we deal with the concepts of modules and dependencies, for example. But as a hol holistic approach, we also c care about the concepts on the dynamics um, dimension where we deal with concepts like streams, changes, isolated changes, delivery of those changes, and drops, which are like tags or releases. So now let's first focus on uh, the, the module part of a modular system. We um, define that each module of the system has to live in its own model repository. And it's a normal CDO model repository with uh, branches and uh, complete version history. Um, all the resources that you want in those models, it's up to you, so user resources. But there is one special resource in it, the so-called uh, module definition resource. It must live at a certain um, position in the folder tree and is called module MD for module definition. And this is what we also call a module manifest. It is really very similar to OSGI, just modeled. So it captures the name and the current version of the module and uh, specifies all the dependencies to other um, modules. And please take note that the version and the version ranges here are really um, P2 interfaces. I'm not sure, probably know about P2, it's the provisioning technology of Eclipse, and we will see later why we did it this way. So, um, when all these models, uh, sorry, modules exist, um, we need to integrate them into a system. And we do that with one additional system repository. This doesn't usually contain user models, user resources, and also no branches other than the main branch, but it captures all the information about the modules, their streams, and so on, in a system resource which lives at that location in the folder path, uh, in the folder tree. So how does this um, system model look like? It, uh, the top level object is the system with a name, and it contains the named modules. They are all E objects here, right? Um, and the modules contain a list of their streams. A stream is a little bit like a branch. Yeah? Uh, a module always starts with an initial stream, 
uh, initially that is a development stream when at some point you can um, stop development there, turn it into maintenance mode and create a new development stream which is based on it. Within these streams you isolate your single commits to the user models in changes and um, these changes can then conveniently be delivered to different streams. So it's a little bit about uh, as if these are the branches, the feature branches, these are the merges, and we have an additional concept, the drops, um, which are typically releases, but it could also be labels, tags, or something. We will see in a minute that you can specify that um, as you want. So all these four concepts on the bottom are baselines. And we have two kinds of baselines. The left two concrete baselines are floating baselines because um, yeah, they they are not limit they are not fixed in time. Yeah. They they go on and on. While the two on the right side are fixed baselines, they, they have a fixed timestamp and you can rely on this. Ba fixed baseline that the content in the repo doesn't change if you use this fixed baseline. Um, there is one special thing about fixed baselines. You may remember that the dependency information between the modules is stored in the module definition file in the repository. But when you create a fixed baseline here, um, this information is copied into the system model so and then it's very easy to query it from outside without opening a module repository that means you have the complete dependency information at least for these two types of baselines in the system model yeah and then there is a little bit of process um, in the system where you can specify your own module types and drop types but it's uh, more a convenience thing not really related to important things so there is some UI that we provide for this um, for these core concepts of CDOLM. The most important one is the systems view. Um, all the systems that are reachable by your computer are shown here. Their their modules are shown. What you see here is exactly an instance of that system model that we just saw. From here you can create modules, you can create new streams, changes, deliver changes to, uh, to streams and so on. Um, so these two types of repositories that we saw um, have a relation between each other. So first, to create a system repository, all you need to do is add a configuration block to your server configuration, CDO server configuration. We don't go into the details here, but you see there's a module template. That means each time someone creates a new module through this view that we saw, a, a new repository is created and configured with this module template here. So once this uh, system um, is running, it creates, manages, and deletes the single module repositories. That's done all automatically by the CDO server then. And keep in mind that these module uh, repositories have their actual dependency informa information in all their branches. Yeah? So, how do we put this all together now? You remember, all you really want in the end is an object graph. And with the resources and the resource set of EMF. So what we need is to configure the resource set differently. And um, for that we introduce the concept of contributable resource set configurers and we implemented one for LM, lifecycle management. And this lifecycle management resource set configurer, it creates a configuration in the resource set, or for the resource set, and in this LM case, it stores a so-called assembly. We called it this way, but if you know P2, then it may help. An assembly is the identical thing as a P2 profile. So it's the result of resolving all the dependency information for a given module. 
Typically, it uh, always starts with a root model a module information and transitively um, collects the, the resolved versions of these dependencies of the modules that are needed. We store the name and the version of these modules there. The name is needed to get access to the right module repository and the version is needed to um, open the correct CDO view to load the right data from that timestamp of that fixed baseline, if you remember. So, um, how are these assemblies created and updated? Um, there is an implementation in CDOLM which is really P2 based. So we are using P2 to read all this dependency information with version ranges. Um, and we do that at checkout time. So when we check out a single module into the workspace, we read the manifest of that um, module then we collect all the baselines from the system model and then we feed that stuff into P2 to resolve the dependencies and give us back the, the re resolution result. And we call that an assembly then. So at that point in time we get a new assembly. You see here that is the first trigger to start this um, assembly update process but there are other triggers. For example, each time Eclipse is started, it's re-resolved automatically. You can trigger it manually. But since CDO is a real-time collaborative technology, each client in the network knows when someone changes a manifest or adds a new baseline. So these two types of triggers also start a re-resolution process. And create a new assembly which is then compared to the former assembly and if there is a non-empty delta um, the user is asked whether he wants to install these updates or not. I think... Ah, yeah, here. And there's, uh, there's a UI, user interface, on top of that too. So we provided a small view, module checkouts, and you can see here, the system detected that someone probably has delivered this change to, to the stream that we are currently in. So it determines that there's an update available for us. And uh, Florian will show you in a minute that we are easily able to just click an install updates button and the models will update at that point. So <coughs> here it goes. So we will have two clients. Um, in the first client, we will create a new module. Uh, in this particular case, uh, it's called, in French, Bibliothèque d'Etiquette. It's basically a library of concepts. Uh, and instead of creating it locally, we will say that we will create it on the server, uh, the collaboration server. And in this case, the it's called Argos because it's the name of the family of uh, CBIs. So it creates it on the server. We see on there that there is a <coughs> new model, Papyrus model. Uh, we will create some concepts in it. Uh, it goes faster because it's not the core uh, important part. It's business uh, logic. Uh, and here at the end, when we're done with the editing, we can check the module manifest and we see that Initially, we have a version defined, it could be changed, but we will leave it to uh, 0 0.1. Um, so now that we're pleased with m this module, we would like to share the work with the others. And from this stream, we will create a new tag, which is a way to deliver to the others uh, the, uh, the work we did. And so on the other client, automat uh, live, real time, I mean, w when we deliver this uh, tag, it, it's available to uh, all the clients. Now on the second client, uh, I will be using this uh, thing uh, and create a new, uh, different modules, a different module, sorry, uh, in a different kind, which is a signaling library. I will uh, put it on the server as well. 
but it, now I, I'm forced to choose uh, uh, a particular parameter metamodel that I would like to refer to. So I picked uh, one that has been already delivered, the tag w I was mentioning uh, before. It creates this new module, and we will see that in this signaling library, if we open the module, uh, we have the dependency uh, to a particular version of the other uh, module. From there, we will create uh, some uh, modeling of the signaling library. Uh, so here we see that we have the content of the other um, um, module. And yeah. Here we will do some editing of the signaling library. Uh, it's, it's basically a state machine with a particular business logic. And when I'm done with the editing, I will be able to refer, so on this uh, signaling uh, function, I will call it, give it a name, so here it's function, and I will be able to refer on the concept to a model element, which is in, in the other uh, module, the previous module I was talking about. So here it's ET. I'm saving that. Um, and now if I get back, so on the other side, the, other, the, the first team who is working on the uh, parameter meta model, they will make some changes. So they basically close and delete what they were working on. And starting from this uh, development uh, stream, they will um, check out, uh, create a new change uh, where they want to update the uh, concept called ET. So here we will just open the uh, Rename this uh, this uh, concept. It could be. It could have been a more elaborated editing, but here just to show how it works. So we rename it. We save this uh, model, and here we will uh, bump the version because we made a change. Even though it's a, a micro change, uh, we just need to uh, increase the version of uh, this module. We save it, and here, when we will deliver this change, because it's not shared to everyone yet, it will create a deliver. It will be made available to the to all the, well, first it will show what is the difference, sorry. Uh, and we see that it's basically a renaming of some things plus the bump on the version in the manifest. We will accept all those changes and commit them. And it's available to all the clients. And here we see a green uh, like update arrow to say that there are incoming changes. And we see that for the dependency we had, we can uh, uh, get the changes. So we can preview those changes and see that indeed ET has been changed. We will accept this uh, new available uh, version. So install the updates. And as we will see in the model, we now depend uh, a little bit down on, on the new uh, version of the parameter meta model. And indeed, in the model, if we look at the uh, function, if we look at the function, here it is. Uh, the concept that we're referring to is not et anymore, it's itinerary uh, in French. So it has been updated automatically to the new version. And we indeed, now we will consider that actually we didn't want this change, even though we had a preview, and we will restrict the version range in the manifest of the signaling library, saying that we uh, exclude the new version. Here it says that there are some updates due to this change that we've made in the version range. We will install those updates, and basically here we see already on the model checkout view that uh, we are getting back to the previous tag version, 
And if we get back to the function, indeed, we're back to the concept uh, on the function, to the ET concept uh, in the function. So that was it for the demo. Um, we will switch to the presentation and so it didn't do it. Yeah. yeah, here it is. Good, yeah, um, that was the demo and actually we'd like to thank you for listening. Um, we'd also like to mention that uh, the CBI stuff, so the product that CEA and developed is not available in the public but all the um, CDO-related stuff, the CDO-LM part, is available already now. So if you want to give it a try, you can uh, start to configure your system first system repository um, and then use the systems view to create modules, streams, changes, deliver them, and so on. So thank you again. Um, We'd also like to thank um, Sebastian Revol, who's present, um, for helping us develop all this um, fancy stuff. And the same holds for Jeremy Tatiboué. Spelled correctly? Pronounced yeah. correctly? Yeah. So, thank you again. And that was too fast. Do you have questions? Please, just thank give you. me a sec. About uh, dependencies, in case you have uh, module dependencies which conflicts with another one, if you have uh, recurrent uh, dependencies, what happens? Is it the P2, P2 layer which uh, runs the, the conflicts? Yes, correct. Um, it's P2 who first detects that. Um, and the resolution error of P2 is signaled in the user interface. You don't get a green arrow, but a red cross. A and, and the message, what is the cause of that? More questions? OK, I'm here, so. Um, I have a question about the uh, size of the model. How, what's, what's, what's the amount of objects in the whole model uh, in the real world of, of your customer? Um, in terms of number of EMF objects, um, it's m hard to say, but m for, for the completing, when you have all the mo modules uh, assembled, um, m multiple thousands, okay. uh, maybe ten thousands, uh, yeah. Okay. So perhaps one additional comment from the CDO perspective. In CDO, the size of the model is not limited at all. So I know of evidence, cu customers who use billions of objects. The problem is you can't load them all together, typically, because of client-side limitations right. and network speed, perhaps. So, so, But it's possible to iterate arbitrarily large models step by step. You know. so there was another question. Um, how is the model being split up into those modules? So, so what's the, the decision criteria? Can I basically do any split or is this bound to the de definition of, of which meta model objects go into which part of the model? Shall I? Yeah, yeah you may. So from a technical perspective, it's, it's resource boundaries. Yeah, but if you know EMF, you know that resources are a technical concept too. So in theory, in theory, you don't need resources in in CDO. In EMF, they they are usually a means to do uh, on-demand loading of objects. But in CDO, objects are loaded one by one, anyways. So in theory, you could have a single resource and put your entire model in that. And you can have these external references, so cross-resource ref uh, repository references, between any two objects. So it's up to you, is a simple question, answer. OK, and um, th then I have a follow-up question. What would happen if I create a kind of modeling conflict? So not on, on um, 
level of, of, of uh, the metadata, so um, I have, have to, uh, conflicting uh, dependencies, but really in the model I have some conflicting objects. Oh, define what are conflicting objects. Okay, okay, okay. Th this probably de de depends on the, the semantics of the meta model, yeah. What, what, what might be considered yeah. conflict. Mm, okay, Probably no technology can, can answer that question and solve it for you. Um, okay, thank you. Other questions? Cedric. <laughs> and thanks for the presentation. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, when you do check out and get the library into your project, do the end user can and do any change into this library or is it uh, only it's read only? only yeah. It's read it's only. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so, so... So technically, um, you remember the assembly consists of a root module entry and the dependency module entries. And all the dependencies, they open read-only views. So their, their distribution to the system is read-only, but the root module is available through a CDO transaction, so that is writable. And so is there, or did you think about adding some kind of mechanism to define what is visible from my module? Uh, what, so you used WestGI P2 for the dependency resolutions, but if you go one step further and say, I have a model, and this model has what I consider an API, and some part of the model are not API, but I deliver them for some reason because the simulations need them anyway and so on. You mean something like the internal ex internal flag in a Yeah, in OSGI you just explicitly define what you export and what you import, mm -hmm. so is that something you did? So I didn't, about? perhaps mm, you did. We haven't <laughs> think of it. Um, so far I'm not sure it would be useful in the particular uh, business case we have, but I kind of agree that it's uh, an interesting uh, idea. Yeah, because right now all the versions are user defined, so you you don't use any kind of semantic versioning. For, well, it might be semantic versioning on your project, but depending on the conventions on on the project. Yeah, yeah. There in the particular project, well, here in the demo, the version were not semantic, but in for the the customer, there is a, such a thing. Yeah, and so having this step further would help. Yeah. to tool this kind of uh, yeah. competition. We, we, we thought of it, and it's actually tricky. But this part on, on computing, uh, like API compatibility, sort of say, uh, we thought of it, but uh, it's kind of tricky. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That's very interesting. <laughs> Good. That was it. Then thank you again, yeah, thank and you. enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah. Thank you.